Imagine it's the year 1545 and you're walking to market in the German city of Mainz. While you're walking, someone hands you a small leaflet. Looking at this printed sheet, you see the Pope on his throne, issuing a papal edict. Standing before him, peasants turn and pull down their trousers, farting at the Pope in response. You're shocked, yet you can't help but chuckle to yourself, <laughs> if uh, a bit nervously. Printed text narrates the exchange. The Pope speaks, Our sentences are to be feared, even if unjust. Response of the peasants, Be damned, and behold our bare buttocks. Here, Pope, is our Belvedere. You smile at the clever plan words, as Belvedere means beautiful view. This leaflet is one of the first pieces of mass propaganda in history. An image created by woodcut and then inked and copied through the printing press, which was, in the 1500s, a revolutionary new media technology. It was designed for the masses. There is printed text for the literate and a graphic picture for the illiterate. Either way, the message is clear. This propaganda leaflet was created by the artist Lucas Cranach, working with Martin Luther, who was the leader of a 16th century theological revolt against the Catholic Church that became the Protestant Reformation a religious movement that split Christianity into two worlds, Protestant and Catholic. This bold, public mockery of the Pope, who was seen as the holiest embodiment of God's word, was dangerous and would have been nearly unimaginable just decades earlier. The Catholic Church was, at the time, the singular religious institution of Europe with unrivaled power and influence. Martin Luther, a German priest and theologian, had grown increasingly critical of what he viewed as a corrupt church hierarchy in Rome. Luther was, more than anything, upset over the selling of indulgences, a kind of free pass that people could buy from the church to skip time spent suffering in purgatory when they died. In effect, the church was selling forgiveness. In Luther's time, the church in Rome had gone on a kind of shopping spree, launching costly wars, holding grand ceremonies, and of course, paying for the greatest painters of Europe, Michelangelo and Raphael, to adorn the walls of the Vatican. It all cost a fortune, and in the early 1510s, Pope Leo X, whose lavish spending left the Vatican deeply in debt, wanted to raise more money to remodel St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, so he ramped up the sale of indulgences. Far away in the German city of Wittenberg, Martin Luther grew furious over what he viewed as the church selling its morality. So in 1517, Luther wrote up his 95 Theses, or Criticisms of Indulgences and the Church Hierarchy, and, according to legend, nailed them to a church door in Wittenberg. Each of Luther's 95 Theses were short, blunt, and to the point. Each proposition could be read and understood easily, unlike the lengthy and obtuse religious writing of the time. Those who believe they can be certain of their salvation because they have indulgence letters will be eternally damned. Christians should be taught that he who gives to the poor or lends to the needy does a better deed than he who buys indulgences. As soon as a coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. Why does not the Pope, whose wealth is today greater than the wealth of the richest Crassus, build this one basilica of St. Peter with his own money, rather than with the money of poor believers? Luther didn't intend to spark a revolution. His theses were propositions for reform, meant to spark theological debate within the church. Copies of Luther's 95 Theses were shared among sympathetic German priests, and using the new mass production machinery of the printing press, they printed hundreds and then thousands of copies in Germany. Clearly, many other priests shared Luther's views, but they were afraid to criticize the church. When his supporters reprinted his words, like a modern-day retweet or share, they created what media theorist Zeynep Tufeki calls a social signaling process, 
by which people feel emboldened to speak out when they see their peers publicly doing so. Within months, this social network of printers and priests had spread Luther's 95 Theses throughout Western Europe. And Luther's 95 Theses all fit on a single page, perfect for the mass production capabilities of the printing press, which could reproduce leaflets and pamphlets quickly and cheaply compared to a lengthy tract or book. Given this low pace of life and limited communication abilities of the time, it was the viral content of its day. Luther's words were electric, a phenomenon, and within a year, Luther was the most popular writer in Europe, making him a kind of celebrity, or in today's language, an influencer with a massive following. Alarmed by Luther's popularity, in 1520, the Pope published Exerge Domine, his official response, in which the Pope censored 41 of Luther's 95 theses, and he threatened Luther with excommunication if Luther did not publicly recant his views within 60 days. Brought before church officials in 1521 at the Imperial Diet in Worms, Germany, Luther refused. I cannot and will not recant anything, since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. May God help me. Sensing his life was in danger, Luther fled and was hidden away at Wartburg Castle by sympathizers, far from the Pope's grasp. Shortly after, Luther was officially declared a heretic and an outlaw of the Holy Roman Empire. That same year, from hiding, Luther and his friend, Lucas Cranach, struck back publishing a masterpiece of visual propaganda aimed directly at the Pope, titled Passionate Christ and Antichrist, a block-printed pamphlet illustrated by Cranach. The pamphlet showed a series of 13 side-by-side -side panel images, with one side portraying the life of Jesus Christ and the other portraying the Pope as the Antichrist. Christ washes the feet of the poor, a procession of noblemen line up to kiss the feet of the Pope. Christ travels barefoot with his disciples. The Pope is carried in a gilded carriage. Christ expels moneylenders from the temple. The Pope counts his profits from selling indulgences. Christ ascends up to heaven. The Pope falls down into the fires of hell, demons clawing at his body. It was a simple, straight-to-the-point visual contrast that even the illiterate could understand. With battle lines drawn, the Protestant Reformation had begun. What had started as a blunt criticism of indulgences and papal excess had turned into a movement calling for radical transformation. Ultimately, Luther would argue that the Pope and priesthood should have no power and that average people should be allowed to read the Bible and interpret it for themselves. By 1522, Luther had published more than 160 different writings, which had been printed an estimated 2 million times. The majority were short pamphlets published in German and other vernacular languages, written for the masses. Knowing the value of Luther's persona, Cranach produced woodcut portraits of Luther that could be reprinted throughout Europe, making Luther himself a visible symbol for rebellion. Cranach portrayed Luther as defiant and humble, the very picture of Christ-like piety. By the 1520s, Luther and his supporters, who had become known as Protestants, were publishing an astonishing volume of writing attacking the church, primarily short pamphlets, but they also waged an unprecedented war of visual propaganda targeting the Pope and church authority. Protestant propagandists often portrayed the Pope using beastly imagery, as a pig, or as a fusion of beastly appendages with hooves, bird claws, scales, or the head of a mule. Their caricatures often employed scatological humor, meant to sully the image of holiness surrounding the Pope. In this print, commoners defecate into the papal tiara, using the crown as a toilet or this depiction of the Pope riding on a sow, holding a steaming pile of excrement while giving a blessing. Some of their propaganda images could be ornate in their symbolism. In this 1535 woodcut by Matthias Guerin, we see the devil in a monstrous form, 
sitting on an indulgence letter and holding a collection can in hand, while its foot stands in a bucket of holy water. In its open mouth, a group of monks and nuns are dining together, while winged creatures fly in the Pope and other dinner guests. All the while, the meal is being prepared in the fires of hell, burning on the monster's back. This print from the 1530s, titled A Fitting Reward for the Most Satanic Pope, depicts a graphic execution by hanging of the Pope and his cardinals. There were, it seems, few limits to the graphic nature of Protestant imagery. To today's eyes, these prints can be unsettling, even in their creativity. This leaflet from 1535 by Protestant woodcut artist Erhard Schoen depicts the devil playing a Catholic monk's head like a bagpipe as a kind of mind control. This print was hand-tinted for visual effect. The visual propaganda of the Reformation has a real similarity to today's internet memes. They were, after all, visceral pieces of visual content designed to shock and inflame, often with a dose of humor. Like memes, these 16th century images were largely made anonymously and were meant to be shared and reproduced quickly and easily. Luther's propaganda war made him influential, and it protected him from punishment. There had been reformers and critics of the church in the past, yet their words and ideas largely failed to spread. Luther's success was, at least in part, lucky timing. The mechanical printing press had been developed in Germany by Johannes Gutenberg in the 1440s. This new technology made it cheaper and much faster to reproduce the printed word. Instead of copying words or images by hand, an expensive and laboriously slow process, a woodcut image or arranged type set in a printing press could make hundreds of copies a day. Before the printing press, the church had a near monopoly over the reproduction of books and other printed material in Europe, which were painstakingly copied by hand by specially trained monastic scribes who worked for the religious authorities. The printing press broke the church's monopolistic control, putting the power of the printed word into the hands of printers who were not beholden to the church. Without the printing press, Luther's criticisms would have likely remained a local complaint, and lacking public support, Luther could have easily been isolated or silenced. Consider the fate of Czech theologian Jan Hus, who, like Luther, criticized the church and the power of the Pope. But the printing press hadn't yet been developed in Europe in the 1410s when Hus was censored and declared a heretic for his views. Seeing the existential threat posed by Hus, the church burned him at the stake. Facing Luther, the Catholic Church was simply unable to match the raw firepower of Protestant propaganda. In the years between 1521 and 1525, when the pamphlet war was at its height, Luther and his Protestant supporters outpublished their Catholic opponents by a margin of 9 to 1 in Germany. But that didn't mean that the Catholic Church stayed above the fray. They published their own anti-Protestant tracts and pamphlets as part of their counter-offensive, known as the Counter-Reformation. And like the Protestant reformers, Catholics turned to cheap, high-volume pamphlets and woodcut prints to fire back. In this dramatic woodcut by prominent Luther critic Johann Cochleus, Luther is portrayed with many heads, alluding to the seven-headed beast of the Antichrist in the Book of Revelations. Each head represented a threat that Luther posed to society, the doctor representing his false teachings, the monk his rejection of monastic life, the Turk the threat of invading Ottoman armies amid a weakened European unity, the preacher Luther's pandering to the mob, the fanatic with hornets, his dangerous ideas, the false pope, and the violent stick-wielding criminal. Thomas Murner, a Catholic priest, attacked Luther in 1522 with his own influential pamphlet, titled From the Great Lutheran Fool. Using verse poem and graphic illustrations, Murner caricatured Luther as a swollen, foolish court jester. This kind of character assassination was at the core of much of the anti-Luther propaganda, given that Luther had become such an influential public figure. For this reason, the Counter-Reformation often portrayed Luther as portly and gluttonous, beer in hand. 
Catholic propagandists also sought to portray Luther as doing the bidding of the devil, and created images that showed demons whispering into his ears, or Luther selling his soul to the devil. In one print, we see Luther standing upon a high pedestal, his feet in chains that are being pulled by demons in the fires of hell, while a winged devil uses a bellows to blow air into Luther's ears, stoking his heretical ideas. In a similar motif, this anonymous print shows a winged demon whispering ideas into Luther's ear, who appears in typical friar garb. Yet, beneath his tunic, we see his legs are those of a beast, and dead animals appear in his track, a sign of plague and pestilence. While some Catholics produced anti-Luther propaganda, they were far less prolific than the Protestants. Instead, the Pope and the Church hierarchy pressed their advantage. Catholic priests in local parishes gave sermons denouncing the heretical Protestants and their dangerous ideas. Over time, the Catholic Church ramped up their efforts in spreading their gospel to win converts. In 1622, the Catholic Church created a new institution, the Sacra Congregatio de Propaganda Fide, or Propaganda Fide for short. It was meant to propagate and spread the Catholic faith. It's also the origin of the modern word propaganda. By the 1540s, the Reformation had converted much of German-speaking Europe to Protestantism, and Luther, despite nearing the end of his life, was as influential as ever. Luther's celebrity and tendency towards extreme language had been incredibly effective in attacking the church hierarchy, yet he also used his power to target the powerless. In 1543, Luther published a book titled On the Jews and Their Lies, in which he called for the violent expulsion of Jews from Europe. Luther wrote, First, set fire to their synagogues or schools. Second, I advise that their houses be razed and destroyed. Third, I advise that all their prayer books and Talmudic writings be taken from them. Luther also portrayed Jews in his visual propaganda, such as this woodcut print showing Jews suckling from the teats of a pig, while a rabbi peers into the pig's bowels to read the Talmud, a sacred Jewish text. In attacking the Jewish faith, Luther was going after a religious minority that already faced widespread persecution by Christians. It's important to note that here, Luther was vilifying everyday people, not challenging a corrupt power structure, and his anti-Jewish writing helped stoke the embers of anti-Semitism in Europe. Centuries later, in the 1930s, Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party in Germany would point to Luther's writings to help justify their vilification of German Jews. The Nazis claimed Luther as part of their heritage. This Nazi poster from 1933 reads, Hitler's fight and Luther's teaching are the best defense for the German people. Or this poster, which proclaims, with Luther and Hitler for faith and nationality. The Nazis were infamous propagandists and demonized Jewish people through mass media propaganda campaigns in posters, film, radio, and newspapers. This propaganda was used to justify their mass imprisonment and extermination of millions of Jews and other groups they viewed as undesirables. The propaganda war between Luther and the Catholic Church raged throughout the mid-1500s and would, ultimately, lead to real war. People chose sides. Power struggles broke out. Near constant warfare between Catholics and Protestants ravaged Europe. The Thirty Years' War, the Eighty Years' War, the War of the Three Kingdoms, the French Wars of Religion. Millions of people died, and the bloodshed didn't stop until the Peace of Westphalia in 1648, more than a century after the Reformation had begun. And even so, tensions lingered between the two Christian sects for centuries more. The legacy of the Reformation's war of words and images against the Catholic Church is profound. Beyond the establishment of Protestantism, itself a religious philosophical transformation with huge impacts on European society, 
their actions stand as perhaps the first large-scale propaganda war that utilized mass media to persuade the public. Their tactics were revolutionary, creatively using a new medium to take on the existing power structure. Tailoring their words and images for maximum circulation, Luther and his supporters generated a popular movement that broke the established order. They forever changed Europe and ushered in a new era where mass media would play an ever more essential role in shaping society.